my boots sloshed through the knee-deep mire, the stench of algae and rotting vegetation barely masked by my rebreather. The air hummed with the whine of a billion razor flies, the only things on this forsaken planet smaller than me and more likely to survive. Two weeks in, and the prospect of finding even a nugget of ceruleanite had vanished like a wisp of swamp gas. Most of the crew had already bugged out. But then, they weren't ex-military with a price on their heads and a pile of gambling debts to make disappear. This job was my one shot at a clean slate. A piercing shriek ripped through the dense, fleshy trees. Not a razor fly. Something bigger. Something far more dangerous. We weren't alone in these swamps. At least not technically. The Vrax, the native reptilian humanoids, weren't known for their sunny dispositions. We had a treaty of sorts. Stay out of their sacred zones, and they'd pretend we didn't exist. So far, that was working out spectacularly for both sides. You heard that, boss? My partner Fitch kept his voice low, his hand clenched around his sonic rifle. I tapped my earpiece. Command? You picking that up? Only static crackled in response. Of course, no signal in this thick atmosphere and the relay satellite we dropped wouldn't be back in range for another two hours. We were on our own. Just nerves, I grunted, pulling out the crude map provided by the corporation. Our zone was still miles ahead. This thing, whatever it was, wasn't Vrax territory. The shrieks intensified, each one closer than the last. The canopy above rippled, branches shaking as something large and heavy fought its way through the undergrowth. Fitch switched the rifle to stun, its low hum almost melodic compared to the rising panic in my chest. I'd heard the stories back on civilized planets, mostly from the drunks in spaceport bars. Tales of megafauna lurking in the Cerulean mire, beasts the Vrax worshipped as demigods, I always wrote those off as the ramblings of men driven mad by isolation. Now, I wasn't so sure. The trees parted, and it burst into view. Not reptilian, not insectoid, not anything I could catalogue in my mind. It stood twelve feet tall on four insectoid legs, each one tipped with a razor-sharp claw. Its torso resembled a mottled, hunchbacked ape, draped in coarse fur, and the head bulbous, eyeless, with a maw large enough to swallow Fitch whole. Before either of us could fire, the beast let out a deafening roar that caused the muck to churn around our feet. It lunged. Fitch screamed. A shrill, short-lived note before he was gone, plucked into the air by those massive claws. The creature thrashed its head, dislodging what remained of him, and then turned those vacant, hungry eyes towards me. Survival instincts momentarily overrode common sense. I squeezed the rifle's trigger. It was like shooting a stun bolt at a tank, useless. The creature let out another roar and charged. This was how it ended then. Not on a battlefield like I'd half imagined, but in a fetid swamp on a forgotten world. In the belly of a monster. adrenaline fueled defiance surged through me. I raised the rifle and used its butt to smash the visor of my rebreather. The stench washed over me, a sickening mix of rot and sulphur. Better to choke on the open air than meet my fate behind a filter. The creature was nearly upon me. I closed my eyes, a final act against the inevitable. And then, a new sound. The rhythmic chop of a repulsor craft's engines. My eyes flew open. A black dropship swooped low, its underbelly cannons glowing a furious crimson. Blinding blasts lanced out, searing the creature. It shrieked in pain, thrashing wildly before collapsing with a shudder, its form dissolving into the mire. I stood there, stunned as the dropship descended and its ramp lowered. Silhouetted in the hatch stood three figures, not corporation goons, but armoured warriors wielding elaborate energy weapons. Had the Vrax changed their minds and decided to wipe us out wholesale? But then, the central figure stepped forward into the dim light. His armor gleamed like polished obsidian, adorned with symbols I didn't recognize. What looked like a sword hung at his hip. It was then I saw his face. Angular, high cheekbones, 
and a jaw sharp enough to cut glass. His eyes, they were the heart of the storm, swirling with unnatural power. This was no Vrax. He was something else, something older. He spoke, and it wasn't the language of the Vrax. His deep voice held an authority that felt ancient, primordial even. You trespass upon sacred ground, outsider. Words I understood, not through any translator, but as though they'd been etched into my mind. Sacred? I spat, the word bitter on my tongue. This whole God's forsaken planet is a festering wound. His eyes, those swirling storm clouds, fixed upon me with a disquieting intensity. This mire is the heart of our world. What you seek, it is not yours to take. I gestured towards the dissolving carcass of the monstrous beast. Tell that to your beloved pet. One of the armoured figures flanking him twitched. Hostility radiated off them, and I tensed, the adrenaline rush giving way to a cold, coiling dread. Still, defiance flared in me. I wasn't backing down. The leader extended a gauntleted hand, a gesture that inexplicably stopped his warriors from attacking. You misunderstand. We did not unleash that monstrosity. We are its wardens, its keepers, just as we are keepers of this planet. Now, that threw me for a loop. Keepers. Not conquerors or zealots, as I'd assumed. Then, why the attack? Our trespass into this sacred ground was purely accidental, I said, choosing my words carefully. We're miners, seekers of Ceruleonite. We had no idea this place held significance. Ceruleonite? He tilted his head, the movement bird-like and curious. The star metal. What use do you have for it, outsiders? Power, I said bluntly. Our civilization runs on it. Without this resource, interstellar travel grinds to a halt. Travel to other worlds, he mused. The hunger to flee your own home is... Curious. There was no pity or judgment in his tone, just an unsettling detachment. An idea surged to life within me. If they didn't understand the value of the resource, perhaps there was room for negotiation. Tell me, I began. If we swear to avoid your sacred places, would you allow us to mine the rest of the planet? He considered my words for a long moment, his shadowed face unreadable. In the distance, the buzzing of razor flies had resumed, a backdrop of maddening noise against the strained silence. Finally, he inclined his head. An accord may be possible, but trust, his gaze grew impossibly hard, is not easily given where you come from. He turned then, his men falling in step and ascended the ship's ramp. The hatchway hissed shut, and the dropship lifted off vanishing with a thunderous roar that left my ears ringing. I stood there in the mire, slick with the dissolving remains of the beast, watching the sky until the dropship was just a speck on the horizon. My deal with the devil, it seemed, wasn't quite finished. Just a whole lot more complicated. Getting back to command was an exercise in abject misery. The muck clung to me, the stink of it so ingrained in my rebreather I had to ditch it halfway and retch my way back, the taste of bile stinging my throat. By the time I staggered into the half-built compound, I looked as wretched as I felt. I was expecting derision, maybe even an unceremonious sacking for failing to find even a trace of ceruleonite. What I got instead was tense silence mixed with a good dose of unease. Well, what the hell was that? Reynolds, the scrawny civilian in charge of the operation, practically squeaked out the question. Our new best friends, I grunted, pulling a chair up to the command console and downloading the sensor readings from my armor. The image that resolved before us wasn't pretty. A massive energy surge right where I'd encountered the beast and the... What were they? Guardians. Wardens. Sweet mother of... Someone swore from the back of the room. You made contact. Reynolds pushed his glasses back up his sweaty nose, eyes wide. They exist? The native legends? They exist, I confirmed. And they're not happy about us poking around. A murmur of worry rippled through the room. We need to report this, 
Establish comms with the corporation. Reynolds began, but I cut him off. No. I fixed him with a hard stare. You report this back, and the suits descend with warships. We'll all be wiped out before we can blink. This wasn't a war we could win, not against whatever I'd encountered back there. Silence fell, thick and apprehensive. Finally, one of the grizzled miners, a veteran named Brock, spoke up. He's right. Corp sends in the heavy hitters, those... Things will retaliate, and we're caught in the middle. I locked eyes with Reynolds. I made a deal out there. We stay clear of their territory. We get to mine the rest. We get our resources they leave us be. He paled. On whose authority? Mine. Because right now, I'm the only one who knows how to keep us alive on this miserable rock. The argument raged on, but in the end, desperate pragmatism won the day. The next few weeks felt like walking a razor's edge. The miners, myself included, ventured out in tightly controlled zones, our sensors hyper-attuned to any anomalies. It yielded some ceruleanite, not in abundance, but enough to keep Reynolds appeased. We learned by trial and disastrous error. Strange fungal blooms marked danger zones, and swirling mists in the air meant the Guardians might be near. The unspoken truce held. But peace, it seemed, was not meant to last. During one mining pass, a rookie got jumpy and opened fire on what he thought was a megafauna lurking in the brush. It wasn't. The Guardian warrior descended upon us in a whirlwind of steel and rage. His energy blade sliced the rookie in half before any of us could react. Then he was gone as quickly as he arrived, leaving us standing over a fallen comrade and the shattering realization that any misstep could earn us a death sentence. That night, a sullen wind whipped through the prefabricated huts of our camp. Rage simmered low in my gut, a bitter counterpoint to the cold fear that clutched at me. The rookie's death was on my shoulders. I'd led us into this damn bargain, and now blood was the price. A knock at the door interrupted my brooding. Brock, the grizzled miner, stood at the threshold. Can't just sit around waiting for the axe to fall, he rasped. He carried several bulky duffel bags which he dumped on my desk. We've been gathering... supplies. Realization dawned. It had been weeks since the incident. The Guardians hadn't retaliated on a larger scale. Perhaps it was as they'd said, they were keepers, not conquerors. Then again, perhaps they were just biding their time, striking when we were most vulnerable. Brock, I started, the words catching in my throat. He held up a hand, silencing me. No speeches or apologies, he said gruffly. What's done is done, but we ain't gonna just wait for them to decide our fate. He hefted one of the bags. Took years of bartering and favours, but I got my hands on some hardware. Enough to send a message clear enough for even those fancy-pants warriors of theirs to understand. Inside the bag, nestled carefully amidst packing material, were heavy-duty mining explosives. The kind usually reserved for cracking open stubborn ore deposits. But in the right numbers, deployed in the right place, they could take down a small mountain. A show of force? I questioned, understanding filtering through the fog of anger. More like a show of teeth, Brock replied, a nasty grin splitting his face. These swamp dwellers think they're the only ones with power? They ain't seen nothing yet. The plan, reckless as it was, took shape quickly. We'd venture back into the restricted zone, find a location far enough away from any known Ceruleanite deposits, yet close enough to a place the Guardians would consider important. One massive, orchestrated detonation, a signal blast shattering the stillness of the mire, a declaration that we were not unarmed, nor were we willing to go down without a fight. The next morning, under the pretense of a surveying operation, a small contingent of us slipped away from the main camp. We were a desperate crew. Me, itching for some retribution, and away back on top, Brock, holding a grudge against those who took his young protégé, and two other miners driven by fear and defiance. Reaching the zone took hours 
our progress constantly monitored for any sign of Guardian activity. Here, Brock whispered, gesturing towards a large fungal growth, close enough to rattle their cages, but not on any major ley line. He began unwrapping detonators and wiring them in a complex matrix. This wasn't just brute force. There was a careful design at play. Brock had spent decades demolishing asteroids. I realized I'd underestimated the old man, seeing him only as a stubborn survivor. In this hellish landscape, he was an artist, and these explosives were his lethal masterpiece. The final detonator clicked into place. Time to let our friends know we're still here, Brock said, grim satisfaction in his eyes. The seconds ticked by with agonizing slowness. Every creak of the trees, every chirp of unseen creatures in the underbrush was amplified in my pounding ears. My fingers tightened around the sonic rifle, more a comfort than a real weapon. If the Guardians charged out of the foliage, we'd be dead before we could raise a defense. They'll come, Brock murmured, his gaze fixed on the fungus where the explosives lay. They always do. He was right. A keening cry, the same one I'd heard the day the monster attacked, cut through the stillness. But this time, there was no monstrous creature in sight. Instead, figures cloaked in their armor emerged from the dense vegetation, their weapons held at the ready. Not a swarm, just a small band, a scouting party perhaps. Their leader, the one with the storm cloud eyes, stepped forward. You dare return, after you have broken the pact. The anger in his voice was controlled, measured, yet carried a promise of violence. We came back with a message, I countered, forcing my voice to stay even. You want us to respect your territory? Then respect our right to survive. I motioned towards Brock, who was already backing away. You attacked first. You spilled our blood. The Guardian shifted his stance, the intricate hilt of his energy sword glowing with an ominous light. It was but one life. One life too many, I shouted, the frustration and fear spilling over. We're tired of living at your mercy. You think you're all-powerful sitting on your sacred pile of rocks, but take a good look around. This planet's rotting from the inside out, and we... We're the ones with the power to save it, or destroy it. Brock had reached a safe distance. He raised a hand and gave me a nod. The show was about to begin. You threaten us, the Guardian leader said, voice dangerously low, knowing you are doomed either way. At least this way, we go down fighting, I retorted, then held up the detonator. See this? One push of a button and a good chunk of your precious mire goes up in smoke. We learned how to play your game, old man. For a tense moment, he held my gaze. I saw the doubt in his eyes. He was no fool. He saw the truth in my words, the desperate gamble we were playing. Then the air rippled and a figure materialized behind him. It was another guardian, older. He spoke to the leader in their flowing tongue, words I couldn't understand, but their tone was urgent. The leader grimaced and lowered his glowing sword. Very well, he grated out. You have your truce, but break it again and there will be no mercy. He turned and gestured to his squad. In a flash, they were gone, merging back into the shadows. Brock let out a ragged sigh. Well, I'll be damned. It worked. I slumped to the ground, detonator still in hand, my heart thundering in my chest. Had we just bargained our way back from the brink of obliteration? Or had we just set in motion something far more dangerous? Only time would tell. Relief washed over me like a tidal wave, leaving behind a bone-deep weariness. We made it, against all odds, against all reason. Brock deactivated the detonator, and we began the long trek back. The silence punctuated only by the omnipresent buzz of razor flies. Back at the camp, cautious optimism and nervous tension greeted us. News of our near-suicidal mission and the precarious truce had spread like wildfire. The death of the rookie still hung heavy, a dark stain on our tentative peace with the Guardians. Days turned into weeks. 
we stuck to the agreed-upon zones, meticulously charting the ceruleanite deposits. The miners worked fueled by the fear of another confrontation and the hope of a quick escape from this godforsaken place. As for me, I found myself inexplicably drawn to the edge of the forbidden zones. A morbid curiosity, perhaps, or a yearning for a deeper understanding of these enigmatic beings. One humid afternoon, while scouting the perimeter, I stumbled upon a sight that sent chills down my spine. An intricate structure, half buried in the muck, made of a material that radiated a blue light. I recognized the symbol carved into its surface. The same one that glowed on the hilt of the Guardian Leader's sword. This wasn't a natural formation. This was something built. Something powerful. Was this the source of the Ceruleanite? And if so, what held them back from claiming it all for themselves? The answer came sooner than I expected. An ear-splitting shriek like a banshee's wail pierced the stillness. It wasn't the Vrax, nor any creature I'd encountered before. This held a primal fear, a raw desperation. I raced back to camp, the urgency rising in my chest. Emerging from the forest, the Guardian warriors weren't alone. They were fighting gigantic iridescent insects, six-legged monstrosities dripping with acidic ooze. Their blades clashed with a crunch against the chitinous exoskeletons. One of the guardians fell, impaled on a barbed leg. The insects, their eyes glowing with malevolent red light, seemed inexhaustible. Panic surged through the camp as the rest of the miners scrambled for their weapons. There was no time for negotiation, for the uneasy peace we'd carved. This was about survival now, for both sides. I grabbed my sonic rifle and joined the fray. The familiar hum a meagre comfort against the sheer ferocity of those insectoid nightmares. The battle was filled with chaos and carnage. The swamp floor became slick with ooze and blood. My rifle overheated, useless, and I switched to my sidearm, a measly pistol against such monstrous adversaries. Then, a blue light streaked across the battlefield. The Guardian leader, his eyes blazing with an unearthly power, unleashed a wave of energy that incinerated a cluster of the insects. Their shrieks intensified, a deafening cacophony. It was as if they sensed something shifting, an imbalance in the fight. One by one they disengaged, retreating into the thick foliage with surprising agility for their size. The battle was over, the silence thick with the stench of burnt flesh and despair. We had won, but at a terrible cost. Several miners lay dead, their bodies mangled beyond recognition. The surviving guardians surveyed the devastation. Their faces grim, their storm-cloud eyes reflecting an internal struggle. Their leader, his armor slick with ooze and stained with crimson, approached me. These beasts, he spoke, his voice hoarse. They are drawn to the core. They seek to consume it, destroy the balance. Core? My mind raced back to the buried structure I had stumbled upon. That... that structure at the edge of the zone, I stammered. Is that it? He nodded grimly. The heart of this world, its lifeblood. These creatures, they are a plague, an ancient enemy drawn by the core's power. The Ceruleanite, the reason we were here, the fuel for our civilization. It wasn't just a valuable resource. It was a target for a destructive force. It wasn't just a resource, it was a lifeline for this planet, and by extension, an unwitting beacon for its ancient enemy. The Guardian leader, his face filled with an exhaustion that transcended the recent battle, confirmed my suspicion. These, these scarabs, he said, his alien voice rough. They are drawn to the core's power. They seek to consume it, disrupt the natural flow. My mind reeled, picturing the blue structure I'd stumbled upon. Is that why you haven't claimed all the Ceruleanite yourselves? To protect the core? He inclined his head, a gesture I was beginning to understand as weary acceptance. We are guardians, yes. We maintain balance. The scarabs. He hesitated, then continued. They are a force of destruction. 
Left unchecked, they would devour the core, plunging this world into darkness. The silence that followed stretched, thick with unspoken questions. The miners, shaken but alive, huddled together, weapons clutched tightly. So what now? I finally asked, voicing the question on everyone's mind. We can't just sit here while these things keep attacking, and you can't expect us to fight your battles forever. The Guardian leader's storm-cloud eyes held mine for a long, probing moment. You are not from here, he finally said. Your technology... It is crude compared to ours, but perhaps... He trailed off, his voice laced with a hint of desperation. A plan sparked in my mind, risky and audacious. We have ships, I said, my voice gaining strength. Advanced communication systems. We can send a message. Call for help from outside. He considered this. What kind of help? The kind that can bring weapons these scarabs won't withstand. The kind that understands the threat they pose, not just to this planet, but potentially to others. It was a gamble I knew, bringing in another unknown force, another group seeking to exploit this world's resources. But at this point, what choice did we have? The Guardian leader's silence lengthened. Finally, he spoke, a hint of resignation in his voice. Very well, but know this, he said, his gaze meeting mine with unwavering intensity. We will not tolerate exploitation. This world, it is under our protection. We will fight alongside you or against you, depending on your intentions. News of my decision split the camp. Some miners, Tired and wary of the constant battles, saw this as a ticket out. Others, like Brock, saw it as a potential trap, the arrival of a new threat to add to the already precarious mix. The debate was cut short by the arrival of a scouting party. More scarabs, they reported, this time in even greater numbers, swarming towards the core. Time was running out. I activated the emergency beacon on our main communication hub, a coded message, a desperate plea for help, hurtled into the vast emptiness of space, carrying the fate of this world and the burden of an uncertain future. Now all we could do was wait, and pray the answer that came wasn't another wave of destruction disguised as salvation. The weeks that followed were full of anxious anticipation. Tension crackled through the camp like static electricity. We rationed supplies, repaired damaged equipment, and trained under the watchful eyes of the Guardian warriors. Every creak in the undergrowth, every buzzing of razor flies sent jitters down spines. The scarabs hadn't returned, but the silence felt as ominous as the screech of their advance. Brock grumbled about trusting space vultures and kept a wary eye on the Guardians, suspicious of their sudden alliance. Evenings were spent huddled around fires, the stories grim and the whiskey a temporary numbing agent. One day, as the oppressive sun began its descent, a tremor shook the ground, a deep rumble that vibrated through our bones. Our collective heads snapped towards the sky. A speck, a single dot growing rapidly materialized in the distance. It wasn't the silhouette of our corporation shuttles. This was something else entirely. The ship descended, with an ear-splitting roar. It landed with a shudder in a newly cleared patch of swamp, spitting mud and ooze. A hatch hissed open and a figure emerged, tall, clad in dark metallic armor that glinted in the dying light. His face, obscured by a featureless helmet, held no warmth, no hint of compassion. He surveyed the scene with cold, calculating eyes. You sent the distress call, the figure stated his voice synthetic, devoid of any human inflection. We have, I said, stepping forward, the weight of responsibility heavy on my shoulders. We need help, these creatures, the scarabs, he cut me off. We are aware of their threat, that is why we are here. He gestured towards the guardians who stood behind me, their faces stoic masks, these beings. His eyes narrowed slightly beneath the helmet. They are the guardians of this world, I explained and they share our enemy. He considered this for a moment, something that might have been surprise crossing his features. An interesting confluence. Very well, we will assist in this defense. 
He walked towards a small device mounted on his suit, activating it with a flick of his wrist. A holographic display flared to life, projecting a complex network of lines that crisscrossed the swamp, converging on the location of the buried core. A tactical perimeter, he declared, his voice flat. My forces will establish this grid. Any further incursion by the scarabs will be met with swift retaliation. And after the battle? I ventured, voice cautious. What happens to this world? What happens to the Ceruleonite? He turned, his gaze meeting mine, cold and calculating. That, he said, remains to be determined. I wasn't sure if it was a threat or a promise, but one thing was clear. Help had arrived. But at what cost? As the alien warriors disembarked from their ship, their faces as devoid of emotion as their leaders, I couldn't help but wonder if we'd simply traded one monster for another. The aliens moved with ruthless efficiency. They spoke in a clipped, alien language, their voices devoid of any emotion but purpose. Within hours, energy fields rose from the swamp, creating a glowing grid that radiated outward from the buried core. Brock watched the spectacle with awe and deep unease. These fellas don't play around, do they? He muttered, the usual spark in his eyes dimmed. No, I agreed, my heart heavy. They don't. The Guardians remained observers, their own powerful weapons still held in readiness. Their leader often sought me out, his storm-cloud eyes filled with questions I couldn't answer. What were these new arrivals? Who did they serve? What fate awaited his world? The answer came sooner than any of us wished. A wave of scarabs, larger and more ferocious than any seen before, surged across the swamp. They crashed against the energy field, their bodies erupting in bursts of sizzling acid. But for each one that fell, two more took its place. The alien commander watched the onslaught from a command post, his expression unchanging. Maintain the perimeter, he ordered, his voice cutting through the humid air. Let them break themselves. And break themselves, they did. The field crackled, threatening to overload but held. The swamp floor grew littered with the chitinous corpses of the scarabs, their red eyes dimming. But their number seemed endless. The aliens showed no signs of exhaustion. Their weapons a relentless tide of light and destruction. That's when it happened. A crack, a rupture in the grid just beyond our camp. A scarab, larger and stronger than the others, smashed through, its segmented body gleaming with malevolence. It charged straight towards us, mandibles snapping with ravenous intent. Chaos erupted, miners screamed and scattered, their sonic rifles a futile defence. The scarab closed in, its stench of acid filling the air. Just as hope seemed lost, a blur of motion intercepted the creature. The Guardian leader, his sword blazing, met the scarab's charge with a roar. The two clashed in a whirlwind of steel and acidic ooze. He was a warrior born, his movements honed over centuries, but the scarab possessed a raw, desperate power. The guardian deflected a slashing claw, but a second found its mark. He cried out and stumbled, his armor seared where the acid had made contact. He fought on, every blow filled with a cold, protective fury. Brock, never one to stand back and watch, hefted one of the mining explosives, heavy enough to crack open a small planet, and charged, bellowing a string of curses. He hurled the explosive right into the scarab's open moor. The explosion rocked the swamp, showering the area with chitin and foul-smelling ooze. Silence descended, followed by hoarse cheering. The Guardian leader slumped to the ground, his breathing ragged, Brock at his side, offering a flask of gritty liquor. The alien commander approached the crater where the scarab had met its end. He studied the remains, his visor reflecting the dimming light. Resilient creatures, he commented, his voice still devoid of inflection. They will return. We will require... adjustments. He turned and walked away, leaving me staring at the Guardian leader and Brock, united in this unlikely camaraderie. It was a bond forged in blood and sacrifice, one that transcended language, species and motive. Years passed. The aliens stayed, their gleaming ship a permanent fixture in the landscape. 
they built outposts and ran research programs. The Guardians, ever vigilant, roamed the swamp. Their numbers had dwindled, losses taken in the unending war against the Scarabs, but their resolve remained unbroken. Their leader, though scarred and older, still held my gaze with that same unbreakable determination. He had become an unlikely advisor. His understanding of the planet's interconnected energy flows crucial in the escalating battle. Brock and I, grizzled and hardened, ran our mining operation with begrudging respect for the aliens and a deep-seated distrust. The Cerulianite flowed, a steady stream fueling ships that now bore both our logos, an uneasy truce represented in cold metal. Our camp had become a strange microcosm of this unlikely world, humans, aliens and guardians coexisting in a fragile equilibrium. Some nights the aliens' eerie chanting would blend with the miners' raucous songs and the low, mournful cries of creatures I never dared seek out. One dawn, as the first rays of light pierced the fog, I found myself on the edge of the Forbidden Zone. The energy fields had fallen silent. No scarabs, no crackling defence against the monstrous horde. Then the ground trembled, and the buried structure I'd discovered years ago erupted from the mire, shining brighter than ever. It throbbed with a new intensity, sending ripples of blue light across the swamp, causing the very air to vibrate. The Guardian leader appeared beside me, a spectre in the dawn light. The core! It is... changing! His voice held a mix of awe and trepidation. From the alien outpost, figures emerged, drawn by the extraordinary energy surge. Their commander approached, his helmet finally removed, his face pale and unnervingly human. It's evolving, he whispered, his steely composure faltering. The core is destabilizing. The mire, usually teeming with unseen creatures, fell silent. Even the razorflies stilled their wings. An oppressive hush descended as if the planet itself held its breath. The structure throbbed one final time, the light blinding, and then nothing. The core went dark, its energy signature disappearing. The silence was deafening. Had the scarabs finally won? Was this the end? Suddenly, a single, faint spark of blue within the structure's depths flashed. It grew, slowly, tentatively, like a flame rekindled in a dying fire. The glow returned, not blinding, but stable, rhythmic. The Guardian leader let out a long breath. Balance, he whispered. A new balance. The aliens lowered their weapons, their commander staring at the core with an inscrutable expression. Brock clapped me on the back, a gruff laugh escaping him. Well, I'll be damned. Seems like we're staying in business after all. The Cerulean mire didn't heal. It never would. It remained a battleground, a place of scars and fragile alliances. Maybe this wasn't a place anyone would choose to call home. But it was our home. We'd fought for it, bled for it, and forged bonds stronger than Ceruleanite. And in the end, perhaps that was the true victory. A shared understanding that in this harsh and unforgiving place, survival wasn't just about strength, but about the unwavering will to adapt and endure, no matter the odds.